Hi, my name is Elizabeth and I would like to take a moment and say welcome and thank you for being here. If you would like to know more of what's going on here at Central, whether upcoming events or just learning more about who we are, check us out on the web, Facebook, and yes, we even have an app for that. If the ministry at Central has blessed you and you would like to give, you can do that multiple ways, whether you visit our physical location, give online, or even through our app. Thanks again for joining us today, and God bless. Uh, I, on your behalf, I spend thousands of hours every week reading the news of the world and um, headlines, bone-jarring crises, fears from plagues and pestilences around the world. And um, I come here to report on those so that you and I can see together the biblical aspect. And uh, I came across one this week or last week that was so so traumatizing that I haven't even sent the picture yet up to the control room. I'm going to send it in a moment. But I told them it's uh, graphic. It's so graphic in nature that I didn't want them to have it ahead of time and to be really paralyzed up there with the graphic nature of this. So I'm going to send this now to Pastor Pete, and he will prep it to go on the screen. And you and I, I want to take this somewhere biblically, but I want you to be able to see this. I think it's okay. Uh, We talk about a lot of tough topics here at Central. We're not afraid to really navigate through the most difficult topics at times and look at them biblically. We're going to do that today. So please prepare yourself. This is graphic. This woman holds the record for the largest mouth in the world. (laughs) Now, anybody can do my job, and most of you can do it better than me. But today with the nuanced professionalism that I have, I'm going to navigate through this headline without getting myself in trouble. I don't know how, as a human being, let alone as one of the feminine persuasion, you would allow yourself to even be considered for something like this. I I don't understand what... And if you read the article, it says she has the largest mouth for a woman. But notice, you can read all the headlines you can find on the Google Internet, and nowhere does it say that in the headline. It says, biggest mouth in the world, well, largest, right? They were very careful there. Biggest mouth in the world. And I think that this lady should sue. I think that she should go after everybody. This particular article is from CNN, July 31st, 2021. But it's one of those things that she seems to be embracing it. Her moment of fame has arrived. She only found out. She knew that she had a larger mouth than most throughout her growing up years. And the article is very, um, I think, very direct in explaining that she felt bullied at times and made fun of. But now she embraces this as a part of her worldwide recognition. All right, go with me now to the book of James chapter 3. James chapter 3. Sister Arzu, so good to see you this morning all the way from India. We've been waiting on you to get here. For the few of you in the world who may not know the full story, Brother Kyle and Sister Arzu were engaged and prepared to be married in April of 2020, and you know what happened. And she is now here and will stay here until Jesus comes back and will not be, will not be isolated or quarantined, and she, they will get married in October, praise God. James chapter 3, look at verse 1. Dear brothers and sisters, not many of you should become teachers in the church, for we who teach will be judged more strictly. Indeed, we all make many mistakes, for if we could control our tongues, we would be perfect and could also control ourselves in every other way. I want to open my phone up here because there's a couple of things I want to grab, I believe, uh, from the King James. So the King James in verse 2 says, if in, For in many things we offend all, if any man offend not in word. 
the same as a perfect man and able to bridle the whole body. I want to talk to you today about the poison that our tongues are and often inflict. When I saw that headline, of course, I I snickered a little bit. I don't know if you did or not. I kind of set you up, didn't I? You were scared to death to laugh. You didn't know what was coming. (laughs) And listen, I'm going to help you husbands right now. Don't say anything about it after church. Just drop it. All right? Picture's gone. Let it go out of your mind. Just leave it. Are we together? All right. I'm just saving you. That's all. Just helping you. And don't bring it up in one of your little marital disagreements. Just Just don't do it. All right? (laughs) So when we look at James chapter 3, he has much to say about the tongue, and none of it is good. And you and I need to understand that this is, this is a problem for us as human beings. But it's not just them out there. James, as you and I know, James speaks to the church, and he speaks to us in a deep and profound way. The book, if you study it or read those who study it, it's difficult, if not impossible, to do an outline of the book because he kind of skips around from place to place, pillar to post. And when you and I are trying to follow it, it changes subjects and it doesn't seem to have that consistent flow. But I think if you come back away from it, the biggest takeaway is where James encourages us to really put action to our faith and how that affects every part of our life. And here in chapter 3, kind of the middle of his letter, What he recognizes and shares with you and I is that there's something that's always sabotaging that. It's not out there. It's in here. And I'll be honest with you. It's easy for me to forget James as a letter and chapter 3 in particular. I don't go there very often. I don't read through it that much. And when I am brought back there, uh, a few weeks ago I read the book of James again, and just got overwhelmed with how terse it was, how direct, and how much it poked at believers. So we're going to look at it today, because he mentions here a little later, and this is where I take my title from, that it's poison. I believe the tongue can be the poison that we often ignore. He says, if we could control our tongues, that's we and us, meaning who? Believers, right? We would be perfect and could control ourselves in every other way. Isn't the tongue amazing? How many of you, not like the lady in the picture, but just of your own accord, are capable of filling your mouth with food? Hmm? I'm good at this. I'm like a pro. I can fill my mouth with multiple types of food. I don't care. Do you remember the uh, ratatouille? And the, the brother, the one rat that loved all the delicious flavors and foods. And, and he's always trying to tell his other brother, hey, do you taste this? Do you taste that? And he'd be going, mm, nah, nah. And he would just be eating garbage, right? Well, I, I'm not quite like that, but I'm capable of, but the tongue, in the midst of all of that, you can take eight pills. How many of you can take five or more of your daily pills at one time? Yeah, see, you're, but the tongue, you let one hair cross over that tongue from the salad bar. I told you, this is going to be a graphic day. You, you don't know. When you come to Central, you got to come ready. You need to go over to Tractor Supply and get some of those boots for out there in the barn because you just don't know when you're in here just what you're going to have to be cautious about. You can be eating a mouthful. You can have gourmet food in your mouth. You may be paying $50 or $100 for a plate of food at some incredible restaurant and bam. And it's, you freeze. Sweat begins to pour down your forehead. You look at those who are at dinner with you and you know this is going to be bad. I'm going to have to reach in my mouth and dig out. In front of them, I'm going to dig out this offensive thing that's in there. The tongue made a discovery. How many of you have never had that experience? Yeah, that's what I thought. Nobody, right? It's amazing. The tongue. I mean, you can, things just a million times a week, stuff passes through, and the tongue's just oblivious. Like it's sleeping or out on vacation. But boom, you let that hair show up. 
And there it is, the tongue is in trouble. When you're sick, they often, the doctor puts that log in your mouth. Well, it's a little tongue depressor. And he's looking in there because it gives evidence of what kind of infection is in the body. But there's another aspect of the tongue, and that's what we want to talk about today. Look at verse 3. We can make a large horse go wherever we want by means of a small bit in its mouth. And a small rudder makes a huge ship turn wherever the pilot chooses to go, even though the winds are strong. In the same way, the tongue is a small thing that makes grand speeches. But a tiny spark can set a great forest on fire. Number one, what is the tongue like? And James tells us. He says it's like... A bit in the horse's mouth that turns the horse. It's like the rudder on a ship that turns the ship. It's like the spark that ignites the forest and turns it to ash. We get, we get lost in the horse and the ship and the fire. And we forget that that's not what James is talking about. What James is emphasizing is that the tongue turns our life. This is what I think we overlook so easily and with such casual concern when we should have alarm. The tongue turns the life. That's what he's saying. The bit in the horse's mouth. He don't want you to focus on the bit. He wants you to focus on the activity that takes place. It turns the horse. The horse might be running straightway into battle. He might be at the Kentucky Derby and about to win, but somehow the jockey slips and now the horse is turned. He was about to receive glory, but he turned. That ship led by the pilot, or we would say the captain, out there just navigating away, so happy to be back having paying customers on board only to find out somebody on there has coronavirus and we're back to square one. But they're out there in the middle of the ocean and that little, comparatively speaking, that little tiny piece of, of metal down there, when, it, when it's activated, turns the ship. 3,000 passengers are ready for their vacation, but somebody's positive with coronavirus, and he turns that ship back around. I remember Dr. Roden, our former district superintendent, was on an airplane flying into the U.S. from Zurich, Switzerland on September 11th, 2001. They were three hours out over the Atlantic. He's told the story. I've heard him talk about it several times, and he said we watched on the screen as we were doing a U-turn and headed back to Zurich. And the pilot said, I'm sorry, but it's important that we go back right now to Zurich. Nobody said anything. Nothing was told to them until they returned, landed. And the pilot said, I need to tell you that America is under attack. And in that moment, that plane turned because that captain, that pilot, decided that they needed to go back. The tongue turns us. I'm going to tell you something. We're on a journey with Jesus Christ. Hello? We're, we're traveling with him. We're, we didn't run a 100-meter dash, and we get a gold medal and say, well, for the next 40 years, I'm just going to take it easy, not worry about the Lord until the trumpet sounds. We are in a journey. We're on a journey that will last our lifetime, and he has goals for us. He has things that we're going to accomplish, and the tongue on that journey, the tongue can turn us off course. Some of you just can't believe that she could put three donuts in her mouth at one time, it says. It's like, who is this woman? I want to meet her. I mean, could you imagine being able to eat three donuts at one time? That would just take, that'd save you tons of time. Just think about how much quicker breakfast would go, right? And your lunch snack and your supper snack. <laughs> Pastor, don't do this to us. Our tongues can turn us in places we don't want to go. And notice that there is an emphasis placed in verse 2 on us, on our understanding of this and how much it, the role that we play in knowing this about our tongue and knowing what it can do. And, and 
unless we submit to the Lord Jesus Christ, unless we understand this, we're never going to discern a need for it. Well, I'm just the way I am. All of us are just the way we are. But he says all of us are to be pursuing perfection. And we know that. We do. Biblically, we understand that. But he says what keeps us in verse 2 is that we can't control our tongues. But a tiny spark, well, let me back up in the phrase before verse 5, in the same way. The tongue is a small thing that makes grand speeches. How many of you know somebody that can make grand speeches? How many of you are watching somebody right now? (laughs) Huh? You and I need to understand that this, this is the reality. He's not saying, well, sometimes or if you don't understand or, or uh, certain people, they come from some other country. Or He's saying, no, it's you right in the church. It's the believers, the people who know God. Now, listen, the unbelievers got the same deal, but they don't know about it and they don't care about it. The Bible says that we will be held accountable for every idle word that we speak. So there's a day coming when they'll care about it, but that day for them hasn't arrived. But because of Jesus, that day for you and I has arrived. So we forget sometimes what all we signed up for. Somebody gives an invitation, an altar call. Maybe you were listening to the radio. Maybe you were watching online, or you were just talked to to by the Lord driving, and as a result of conviction in your life over a period of time, you surrendered to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, and you said, here I am, Lord, take me. And Jesus said, thank you, I will. And you said, Lord, I give you everything. And the Lord said, I'll take everything, the good and the bad. Well, Lord, I'm going to serve you. If you send me to the ends of the earth, I'm going to go. Hallelujah. And Jesus said, nope, I don't want to send you anywhere. I just want to control what you say. Well, now, time out, Lord. I think we need to maybe work out a negotiated truce here. And there's none of that with the Lord Jesus, is there? Here's the second thing. Look at verse 6. And the tongue is a flame of fire. It is a, I want you to listen to this. The tongue is a flame of fire. It is a whole world of wickedness, corrupting your entire body. It can set your whole life on fire, for it is set on fire by hell itself. People can tame all kinds of animals, birds, reptiles, and fish, but no one can tame the tongue. It is restless and evil, full of deadly poison. Now here in verse 8 in your study Bible, if you have one, you will notice that it footnotes that word tongue. And it tells you that the Greek word is glossa. Many of you in our church and other churches like ours know that word. From, it's the base for glossolalia. When we talk about somebody praying in tongues or singing in tongues. And the word really, if you look it up, it's number 1100 in the back of your uh, New Life Study Bible. And it literally means tongue, the tongue, but it also means language. And that's why the newer translations translate Acts chapter 2 and other places as languages. They shall speak in new languages. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 14, I thank God that I pray in languages that I don't know more than you, and I will sing with the Spirit. I will bless with the Spirit. He's talking about the fact that this is languages. It's not gibberish. It's not uh, euphoria. It's language, and you, when you're in that, you know it. You sense the punctuation. You know that it has content and context. You know that there are nouns and verbs. I'm not saying that you go through that when you're praying in the Spirit, but you know that it's a communication with God because you get into a rhythm that sounds like a language language because it is a language. And so James comes along and says, listen, you need to understand something about your tongue. Now here's how he describes it. A world of wickedness set on fire by hell, deadly poisonous. Wow. You talk about graphic. You talk about being condemning towards us, a tough judge. Wow. Come on, James, don't you know that we're not supposed to judge anybody? But he doesn't judge just anybody. He judges everybody. Your tongue is deadly poison. How, how, when was the last time you thought that way of things that you say? Like never. I don't know that I ever have. 
And I'm recognizing that God is very concerned about this because he takes up a big chunk of his limited real estate talking about it. And you know what I say. For all of the money that Elon Musk has or Jeff Bezos has left after his divorce or uh, who's the other one? Uh, Bill Gates, whatever he has left. They can't buy. They can't even buy. What's, what's the word of uh, will of fortune? I want to buy a vow. You can't even buy a vow, let alone a word or a sentence in here. You can't. You can write it in. You can have somebody put it in there and print. But the devil won't honor it. And neither will heaven. It's not God's word. This is valuable, priceless real estate, and God takes up a lot of space here. Well, I'm not sure that James, you know, the Apostle Paul would help us to understand. Listen, the Apostle Paul is in harmony with James the Apostle. James knows what he's talking about. He's one of the guys that said, oh, that's my brother, he's crazy. That was poisonous. Hurt him hurt his soul, hurt his spirituality. We don't know a lot about what takes place at the close of the Gospels and the beginning of Acts in the sense of how did these half-siblings of Jesus come to this place. But you have to, you, you, you and I must recognize that they had seen some things. Even though they were critical, even though they were somewhat unbelieving, something was happening in them where they said, uh, maybe everything that's going on here really is the Word of God. You know, we get here and we just find out James he just says, I'm a slave of God. But he knows what it is to speak poisonously. And I'm not telling you that he was out there necessarily speaking against the, the uh, Roman, um, what did they call? Emperor. I, I got traumatized by the picture today. I'm struggling here. I told you how graphic it was, and I just can't get that. And then why would she pose that way, you know? Come on, just point at it and smile and say, um, they took a tape measure and would you, knowing that everything today is seen all over the world on the internet, would you really say, yeah, come and, come and get a picture of me with my big mouth and uh, tell everybody that I got the biggest mouth in the world? I wouldn't do it for a billion dollars. Now, here's what I want you to see. You and I need to pay attention to this phrase. It corrupts. The entire body. It is a world, a whole world of wickedness, corrupting your entire body. This poison that is the tongue affects me. It affects me all the way through. Now listen to me closely. You could very well be faced with physical maladies. You could be having certain sicknesses as a result of something you said. I said may. I'm like the news reporters that say, you know, maybe, maybe society's going to fall apart. Maybe climate change is going to wipe everybody out. I love how they're doing the news in this maybe. Maybe it's not news. News is supposed to be fact, right? Well, anyways. So I'm telling you that this is something that I can't tell you, and it's not every single time. But according to God's word, it can happen sometimes, probably more often than we're aware of. And the only way you and I can know is the discerning of the Holy Spirit. And what the Spirit wants to help us understand is if that poison has moved from having said something outwardly to leaving its deadly work inwardly. Notice what he says very carefully. It doesn't affect your spirit or your soul. It affects your body. King James, same thing. The word in the Greek, very clear. Oh, he doesn't say nuclear weapons bring harm to the body. He doesn't say if the environment becomes too bad, too much trash at the dump and we have to close it down, there's too much bad air, bad water. He says it's the poison. Think of that. When is the last time you saw somebody on YouTube or on Facebook News or uh, is there still ABC News or NBC or anything like that? Did they have news? I don't know. But it, when was the last time you saw them say, we're, gonna, we're presenting to you an article that we need to take great 
care with what we say because there's a poison that comes from our words, and that's why many are sick. Now, we have two other directives like this in the Word. Communion. If we're not doing communion right, it can lead to our body being afflicted. And sexual sin. If we're outside of marriage, it can affect the body. And here's the third one. So if you need healing, you can certainly come and say to God, will you heal me? God, I seek your face for healing. As a matter of fact, I think if you're a believer, you should. God, I want your healing power so that you can receive glory. But let me tell you something. You and I should follow up by saying, is there anything that's keeping me from being healed? Is there anything that has led to? I'm not talking about what did you eat and that might have produced a sickness in your body or, or were you exposed to certain chemicals at work. All of that may be true, but that's not what God's asking us to get at. He's asking us to talk to him and say, would you show me if I need to come in to obedience in some area? Last week, Pastor Mike Stottlemyre was here. The message he did Saturday night touched me deeply. And that idea of, Dr. Paul I does a lot with this too, the outer court of the tabernacle or eventually the temple, but then the inner court and the holy place, the holy of holies. The difference between the inner courtyard, the holy place, and the holy of holies is one of obedience. Understanding, the only way to go into the holy of holies is to understand that you disobey at the cost of your life. That's the holy of holies. That's the only distinction. I know the high priest was the only one who could win there, but the veil's torn now. We're allowed to go in. But what remains is when you and I go in there, it's deadly. And we have to be serious. All God's looking for is obedience. Oh, that's all. How many of you have been walking with Jesus long enough to have discovered that's the hardest part? Huh? Come on, whoa, we can do a lot of things, but obeying. This poison affects me, me. It doesn't affect the other. That's what I want it to do. My flesh wants it to affect the other, but the poison, the Bible says, affects me. It can set your whole life on fire. Now notice he conditions it. It can. It doesn't have to, but it can. For it is set on fire by hell itself. Good Lord, help us. People can tame all kinds. You know, folks come to altars all over the nation, around the world, because they want to be set free from drug addiction. They want to be set free from alcohol addiction or darkness. They want to be healed from their abuse, but how, when was the last time anybody ran to the altar and said, i got to get saved, my tongue is poisonous? I, I've got to get saved. The, the things that I'm saying are killing me. They're literally killing me, and I've got to come to Jesus, but that's what the Bible says. Okay, here's the third thing. Verse 9. Sometimes it praises our Lord and Father, and sometimes it curses those who have been made in the image of God. And so blessing and cursing come pouring out of the same mouth. Surely, my brothers and sisters, this is not right. Does a spring of water bubble out with both fresh water and bitter water? Does a fig fig tree produce olives or a grapevine produce figs? No, and you can't draw fresh water from a salty spring. Number one, what is the tongue like? Number two, what empowers the tongue? Hell. And number three. I've prayed with a lot of people, and I've never had somebody say, I need set free from my tongue. They'll say, I need set free from this darkness, that darkness. There's stuff moving around in my house. There, there's temperature changes from room to room. My kids are seeing things. They're, they're seeing demons, and there's curses. And I got, I've prayed with lots and lots of people about those kinds of things. But I've never had somebody say, you got to pray, my tongue is my tongue's full of hell. Pretty sobering, isn't it? That our God would take this stance with us. But watch, this thing gets good. You can't. The last phrase, does a fig tree produce olives or a grapevine produce figs? No, and you can't draw fresh water from a salty spring. Number three, what is my tongue capable of? Certainly cursing others, but importantly, blessing. This is where James has been going with this. 
He's saying that you can't control your tongue. You can't change your tongue. But there's something that takes place that re basically replaces the poison. And that is when you and I allow the Lord Jesus Christ to speak blessing through us to others. Now, who am I supposed to speak blessing to? Notice that he doesn't limit it to the church here. He says it can speak blessing and at the same, out of the same mouth, it speaks curse to those who are made in the image of God. So who's made in the image of God? Republicans, but not Democrats. Conservatives, but not liberals. Whites, but not minorities. Straights, but not homosexuals. Now, if you look up your Greek word here, this is footnoted as well. You'll see a little letter there beside blessing. And if you look over in that center column, there's a word you should recognize. In the Greek, it's eulogia. You should recognize it because it's the same. It's where we get our word in English, eulogy. How about that? Do you know what God's asking you to do? He's asking you to do what we know to do, to not wait until you're down at Scarpelli or up church or Adams or any other funeral home to not say, oh boy, I got something good to say about this person. How many people do you know have said, listen, I don't want to die and then have people who wouldn't even talk to me before come and say good things about me now. And all of us agree that the time to say good things is before we get to the funeral home about somebody. And that's exactly what God's word says. He says, you you have got to speak blessing, not just once in a while, not just when you feel like it, not when they've done good to you, but even when they've done bad, even when they've brought curses against you, even when they've done wickedness or violence against you, even when they've testified falsely, lied about you, accused you, even then, I want you to do a eulogy over them. You tell people how good they are. You tell people how great they are. You tell them how much God shines through them. Just bless them. But pastor, I can't do that. I'd be lying. You lie all the time. You might as well lie for the right reason. <laughs> I'm sorry. I didn't mean to say that part. Now, I'm not talking about any kind of lying. I'm talking about speaking what can be true of the person. That's all. I'm limited to that, okay? But, but, but just seeing something else in them. Pastor, I can't say that the people are in sin. Why not? Because they'll think I'm endorsing how they live. You can't convict them anyway. You can shame them and you can condemn them, but you don't have the power to convict them. But I know the Holy Spirit does. And this is where we run into trouble because this isn't power, possible. None of this is possible without the Holy Spirit. And that's why, friend, this is why he brings us to that place of saying, now that you've met Jesus, will you please allow the Holy Spirit to fill you to overflowing? And when the Holy Spirit fills you to overflowing, cherries pop out of your ears. Peaches drop out of your nose. No. Words of praise come out of your mouth. Because it's poisonous without the Holy Spirit. There's nothing else that can be done. You can pierce your tongue. You can cut your tongue out of your mouth. You can get it tattooed for all I know. Somebody's probably tried that. But I'm telling you, you cannot depoison it. You can't remove it like taking the smell out of a skunk or the claws off of a cat. Hallelujah. But what you can do is allow the Holy Spirit to be Lord over that tongue so that when you see somebody, instead of saying, how can I respond to this? How can I respond to this? You say, i got to bless them. How can I speak a you? over them. You might as well go ahead and speak it because they are on their way to death and you can speak good about them before they die and meet God. God's not mocked. He is not mocked. No matter what anybody does, no matter what they say, no matter what National Geographic says or the news media, no matter what any of the other cultural bellwethers say, it doesn't matter. God is not mocked. He's God. He's not threatened in his position. He's not afraid. Everything's about to slip through his fingers. He's in control. He's Lord over everything. And you and I can honor his word and obey and say, well, look what God is going to do here before this person meets him. Well, pastor, they might not die for 12 years. No, they might not. But they'll always remember what you and I said about them. I have a fear right now that the American right, conservative, self-proclaimed Christian movement 
has morphed into Christian jihad. And there's a belief that we're waging a holy war. And we have to take things back. Friend, those words are poisonous. There's no such thing as Christian jihad. We're not waging a holy war. We're not trying to win back the culture and and redeem all the buildings so that Jesus can come and be happy with how good we are and how strong we were. He doesn't need any of this. He's not coming on any of this. When he got down, done praying up on the mountain, the wind brought him from the mountain to the water. Then the water carried him the rest of the way. He doesn't need our buildings. All of nature bows before him. Everything is at his disposal. Nuclear power bows to him. Solar power, wind power, you name it, it's all here to worship him. He doesn't need anything from us. He's not impressed by anything we can do except when we surrender and lay down and say, this tongue of mine is poisonous, but I'm so glad I've got the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. And I'm not just going to pray in tongues in my closet. When I walk out, I'm going to eulogize somebody. When I walk out, I'm going to speak blessing over them so that they are transformed by the power of God. What is my tongue capable of? Uh, That eulogy is number 2129 in your study Bible. And here's, I want to close with this. There's another word here that's really cool. In the King James, it talks about sweet water. And here in the New Living, um, it uses the word spring water, fresh, fresh water in 11 and in 12. And the King James uses the word sweet. In the word, the, the Greek word means both, fresh and sweet. But it's another word that you'll recognize in English. Glucose. That's the word. Glucose. Now do you understand how God wants you to talk? Sister Pam would describe it as southern sugary sweet. Huh? That's how God wants us to talk. Glucose. It's, I don't think it's footnoted in your book there or in your Bible, but you can look it up. Glucose. Twice. Twice. Now, James paints a really dark and negative picture to come all the way down to this driving home point. Forget all of that. You can just zero in on this, bless people, just bless people. But, Pastor, it's hard. Listen, you don't tell them you're preaching to the choir. It's horribly difficult. I've 10,000 times, probably just in the last week, I thought, oh, why didn't I say this? Why did I say that? We go through this again and again and again, believers and unbelievers, but we're the only ones who have the Holy Spirit to help us, and we have God's word of revelation to know what he demands from us. This isn't an if you feel good about it. This This isn't a well on those days that you want to try. This is a command. When you and I say, Jesus, here I am to follow you and obey you, we are saying, I will obey James chapter 3. I'm going to eulogize people every day, all day. I'm going to speak sugary sweet to them. I'm going to bless them. And in blessing them, that blessing will come back on me. I'm going to be taking the poison out of my tongue, not by my own power. I can't even recognize when it's happening. I think I'm saying something great. If texting teaches us anything, it should teach us that we don't know how what we're saying is being received. And the Holy Spirit comes and says, I know. I know what you want to say. I know how empowered you feel about saying it. I know how justified you think you are, Doug. But that's, it, none of that matters. What I want you to do is speak sugar. <laughs> I don't want poison, but I just want a little zinger, just a tiny little zinger. I I don't want to hurt them. I just want to tag them and remind them who I am. I was thinking as I was preparing of a situation I had at a church in the 1990s. We were pastoring in West Virginia. I'm not sure that the Lord doesn't want me to try and make it right. We'd ask the business next to us. There was some business there, a tire shop or something. And we'd look out every so often. They'd be parking in our parking lot. We were growing like crazy. Church was just growing, new people all the time. And we were running out. We had no parking. And people would pull in, and we'd watch them, and they'd see that there were no spots. And they'd leave. Well, the tire shop, at the end of the day at 5 o'clock, they'd have some cars that didn't, didn't have room for them. They'd just bring them down park them in our lot. 
Now, this didn't happen so much on the weekend, but on Wednesdays. And I would look out, my deacons would look out, and here's two or three cars from the tire shop. And I got people pulling in the lot and leaving. Do you know what that does to a pastor? Ooh, it gets the poison flowing, buddy. I'm telling you, it's flying. So I went and I said, sugar sweet. I'm telling you, I love them. And I said, hey, guys, listen, here's where we are. We use them as a business for our van and whatnot. I said, we, you know, we, we just can't afford any extra spots. Oh, hey, we get it. It, will, it won't happen again. Thank you for letting us know about it. And we're the next Wednesday. You know the story, right? The next Wednesday, because Satan heard everything, I have no doubt. I don't know if you've ever met him, but he lives in my life. He stays very close to me and observes. He, even when God calls him and says, have you seen my servant? He comes to report. He says, yeah, I've seen Job and I've seen Doug. I'm telling you, I can tag either one of them. And I don't know why God always looks at me and says, go ahead and get him. But, uh, next Wednesday night, we looked out. Lo and behold, I see cars out there. People pull in. No spots left. They leave. And these cars, I know these cars because they were there at 4 o'clock. They were there at 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock. Now it's 7 o'clock and they're there. Whew. I'm telling you the next day, poison was flying. And I went up there and I said, listen, that's the last time. It just was not a good look. Did I give them a warning? I did. But that warning did not prepare them for what was coming. Oh, I'm not saying like I got raging angry, but I broke any opportunity for them to see God's sugar sweetness. I'm going to tell you something. That's been more than 20, probably 25 years ago. And when I was walking the other morning, that popped into my mind. Do you know who popped it there? Not the devil. He popped it there the first time, but he didn't pop the memory there. Bow your hearts with me this morning, please. Father, we are needy. We are needy beyond what we can ever understand. It's so easy for us, Lord, to think that everything's great because we're worshipers. And, Lord, the worship this morning, I heard your people engaging, and, and it uplifted me. Certainly it uplifted all of us. We think, Lord, because we read your Bible that we're, we're fine, everything's good, and we've been reading. We're reading the whole Bible together this year, Lord, and it's been a blessing. But Lord, we come into your house and we're reminded sometimes not of the size of our mouth physically. It's not about the dental work or our, our lips or tongue. It's not about the ability to taste that we have or losing it through COVID. It's about our words and how easily our tongue surrenders to the hell that fills it. It's about how our tongue is unruly, poisonous, and unbridled. But it's also about the power of the Holy Spirit to come and speak not only blessing through us, but to speak it sweetly. Thank you for emphasizing that. Would you touch us this morning? Now your heads are bowed, church, and you know what's coming. I don't want to know about what you might have said. Maybe you said it to your spouse. Maybe you said it to a student at school, and you're a teacher. Maybe you said it to a long-lost cousin. Maybe you said it to somebody on Facebook or by a text. I don't know. I shared one of mine with you. I'm not asking you to share any today. But I've come to this altar today to tell the Lord that I need help. I've come to this altar to say to the Lord, I had grossly underestimated how serious he is about this. I grossly underestimated how easy it is for me to ignore it, evade it and only joke about it. I come to this altar today 
begging the Lord, pleading with the King of glory that he would allow me to see deeper than what I've been able to share with you today, that he would give me the eyes of my understanding being open to move into a place in the spirit of the living God where my tongue is surrendered, submitted, and sold out to the ways of the Holy Spirit, that I can eulogize people who don't deserve it, just like I got the blessing of God's grace and favor when I didn't and still don't deserve it. I ask him that he would help me to eulogize people when they've come at me with anything but. I ask him that he would give me the anointing to bless them, to see above this world, to see above this situation. God, I pray today that you would help me to close my ears to the culture, even of the right, even of the conservatives, even of religious people who seem to be clamoring for some sort of Christian jihad and remind me that that is not your word. There is no holy war with others. There's a holy war with myself, my flesh, that part that's unsurrendered in me. It's 10,000 times easier to point out enemies in this life than to speak a eulogistic, sweet, Sucrose word. Help us, Jesus. Help us, Jesus. If you're here this morning and you would say to the King of glory, would you help me with my tongue? I want you to join me in standing today. I'm not asking you to do something that I'm not doing. If you want the Lord's help with your tongue, you want his anointing to speak prophetically and to speak powerfully, blessing into the lives of others, I want you to stand this morning. Can I tell you that this is the hardest thing that I wrestle with? It it is. There's just no doubt. And it's the thing that I most ignore, even as a believer. And I think maybe it's because the last couple of years I've focused so much in my walk with the Lord, my prayer time, just on praying in the Spirit, that I'm starting to see some deeper themes. And I'm starting to see the effect that it has even on my body. I want to pray for you right where you are. And I want you to ask the Lord, Father, is there anything, any conversations I've had, or even a manner of speaking that's creating a physical affliction in my body? Jesus, would you point that out right now? Now, I'm telling you, I've been praying about this. And if something jumped into your mind, there's a very good possibility that it's the Holy Spirit pointing out. It's not the devil. I doubt that it's even your memory. But the Holy Spirit could be pointing out to you an area in which a gate is open and sickness or disease or some sort of affliction is there. Here's the good news. We serve the healer. We serve the forgiver and the one who can close that gate and say, may your body be healthy. Father, if I've, (laughs) let me rephrase that, Father. For the things that I've said to people that have created brokenness, for the things that I've said that have put distance, Lord, for the fact that I failed to bless when I should have, that I wasn't sugar sweet when you were calling me to that, Lord, would you not only forgive me, would you forgive my brothers and sisters? Tell him right now, Lord, forgive me but would you bring us to a place of discernment as to when that's getting ready to happen in us? We're the body of the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't care if Bitcoin is worth $3 billion a piece. I don't care who sits in the White House or on the Supreme Court or in Congress. It matters not to me. It's about bringing people out of darkness into the kingdom of your dear son. It's not about someday if we get the government right and the culture right, people will love Jesus. It's about loving them when it's tough to love them, reaching them when they're unreachable. Reinhard Bonnke called it 
plundering hell to populate heaven. Lord, remind us it's dirty business, it's hard work, and it takes two mighty angels on each side of our big mouths, and we have to submit to them and say, always protect us from the hellish poison that's in here. Jesus. Now, we're going we're gonna to worship for just a moment. And if you say amen to any of that or you want to pray it your own way, if you feel God working on you, I want you to just slide into this altar and just stand. You're not saying anything to anybody else. You're just talking to the Lord. Lord, help me. And I'm going to slide in with you. And as we come into this altar, I want us to say to the Lord, God, this is important to you. Make it important to us. Amen, Father. As we come into this altar, we recognize the value that you place on this. This is a kingdom value that our tongues be submitted to you. Lord, help us, help us, help us to speak blessing more than we've ever spoke it before. Come on, Brother Cameron, lead us this morning in some worship. This altar's open. Come on, just slide in. Say, Lord, I hear what you're saying. I want the Lord to use my, my words to bless. I want him to get glory through the things I say. I don't know that any of I certainly know I'm not going to be perfect at this. But I want to seek that in the Lord. I want him to have control of my tongue more than I've let him have in the past. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for what you're doing in this altar today. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you for helping us to know your word and to make it known for believing your word treasuring it so much so that we say God your word is true hallelujah glory 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 now Lord bring healing in this place bring healing Lord thank you Jesus if anything I've said has contributed to somebody's difficulty in getting healing. If anything I've said, Lord, has kept somebody from being healed, please point it out. Don't just forgive me, but point it out. Point it out, Lord, that I might make it right. If I need to talk, if any of them are still alive at that place in West Virginia, Lord, point it out and help me to know how to, how to do that. Some things, Lord, I just need to leave under the blood. They're, there, there's too many missing pieces, but I bring that to you today to say, Lord, I want to be. In these last days, there's no doubt this is it, Lord, and I want to be fully surrendered. I, I want to be the way Jesus wants me to be. Thank God for the Holy Spirit. Thank God for the Holy Spirit. Hallelujah. Oh, hallelujah. Pastor Mike was praying for folks last Saturday night just said, oh, Father, I wish that a thousand people were here to be brought in to a relationship with the Holy Spirit, the baptism in the Holy Spirit, praying in the Spirit, words of glory, prayer of glory, singing in the Spirit, blessing in the Spirit. Thank you, Jesus. Help us, Lord, to speak glucose. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Praise God. Sister Pam, will you come this morning and close us out in prayer? Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. This altar is open. Stay as long as you'd like. Hallelujah, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah, Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for the sweetness of your presence in this house today, Father. We thank you for the word of God preached today, Father, that brings not just conviction to our hearts, Lord, but correction to us, Lord. We thank you that for the pastor that we have, Lord, that will bring truth to us, Lord, and take the word of God and, and let us see it, Lord, a mirror of ourselves, the things that we need to change, the things that we need to yield to the Holy Spirit. And I pray, God, that we would make that choice today to allow the Holy Spirit to guard our mouths, our attitudes, even our actions, Lord, in the name of Jesus.
Father, we thank you for Cameron today and Lane. Thank you, Father, that they came and, and helped me out today, Lord, and was such a blessing to this congregation. I thank you for every individual that made it out today, Lord, and I speak a word of blessing over their life. I ask, God, that you would watch over them and protect them in all that they do, Lord. I pray that you would bless their businesses, bless their homes, their children, and their grandchildren, Lord, that even in the time of chaos and struggle and hardship, Father, your people are being blessed. You are ministering to their hearts, their spirits, and their minds. Lord, I speak your glorious presence over them today. We give you all honor, glory, and praise in this house today. In the mighty name of Jesus, amen. Lord bless you and keep you. We love you.